I'm starting. If I'm starting with my presentation, let me just briefly say that um, I am giving similar lectures a couple of times already over the last couple of years. And um, in the in the beginning, I have been talking mostly about the technical details and uh, about the challenges. Over time, I have uh, I realized I'm talking more about, more about the potential applications and applications that we see uh, are working. And um, more recently, people have criticized that I should be talking a bit more about the methods again. So um, I think the, there's a broader audience interested in the application. So please just ask me all the technical details afterwards if you think that my presentation was too shallow. But I think I have to just make a compromise. Um, let me start by just stating that uh, uh, our goal is a whole brain MRSI at a seven Tesla, because I think this is uh, clinically much more attractive than uh, just uh, well, so basically using uh, MR spectroscopic imaging in a way as any uh, conventional MRI uh, technique. So here is, for example, a very established technique for three Tesla MRI, which is a Grappa encoded EPSI sequence, which was uh, developed by the group of uh, Andrew Motsley with uh, typically 50-50 times 18 matrix and covering essentially the whole brain in about 15 minutes. And he has also a pretty established processing package available for this, which is called uh, MIDAS. And you can see you can generate metabolic maps of NA, creatine, and so on, and display um, a, a spectra along with this. And uh, although this is not fully implemented, I think this is the most uh, established uh, processing pipeline that exists for MSI. But at 7 Tesla, we realized we have to do a couple of things uh, differently because there are some technical challenges. Uh, first of all, there is the relatively poor spatial selection because of chemical shift displacement errors. Then we all know that there are inhomogeneities in the B1 and B0, which are a, a challenge. Then uh, increasing problems with lipid and water artifacts. Uh, specific absorption rate problems are not new, of course. And because T2s are, are getting shorter, uh, there is also uh, additional signal loss associated with this. And a couple, uh, like 10 years ago, there have been a, an array of very different approaches how to overcome these limitations. One uh, approach that has been very successful for single voxel spectroscopy is a semi laser technique, which essentially is a uh, 90 degree excitation parsing and four adiabatic half passage parses. And uh, it solves many problems for single voxel spectroscopy, but less so for MRSI. As you can see here, you still have, um, even when you compare a standard press sequence or this new semi laser approach at three Tesla and then at seven Tesla, some shift of the metabolic maps that you see, and you are confined to a rectangular box. And you have uh, still some problems with specific absorption rate problems and so on. Um, then uh, Anke Henning proposed in 2009 an approach that uh, does not use any echoes, which was quite unusual for the acquisition. And if she worked on a very accurate localization approach. Uh, she had a six milliseconds acquisition delay. She invested considerable time into optimizing uh, the water and uh, lipid suppression. There were still some issues with field homogeneities, but probably the biggest disadvantage was the excessive uh, SAR. And you can maybe look at this sequence diagram. There are so many pulses that uh, finally it's not surprising that the repetition times had to be six uh, seconds and, and longer partially. And uh, therefore it was only possible to uh, acquire relatively low spatial resolution with uh, relatively slow scans, 30 minutes per single slice and making optimizing the OVS uh, pulses was difficult to, to reach a 3D setup. Nevertheless, you can see that you, with this approach, you can essentially map uh, many more me metabolites which were not accessible before. Uh, but uh, looking at all these limitations like SAR and uh, so on, uh, we can really see that it's necessary. it was necessary at that time but to go a probably very different approach. 
simplify the whole sequence. And uh, even though it was uh, obvious that there would be lots of challenges involved in, in this approach. So uh, what we did, uh, and also others, uh, was introduce this FID MRSI approach with no echo time at seven Tesla. And um, here are some very early results. Uh, so we could map a couple of more metabolites that then is typically possible with press. We could solve the chemical shift displacement error with this. It's a very B1 uh, insensitive sequence. Uh, SAR limitations are practically absent. And there is no T2 related signal loss and even no J coupling related losses. And although it took still quite long, it's already four times the uh, number of voxels than uh, we saw just in the uh, presentation or the publication from Anke Henning's group. And a major advantage is that we have acquired basically uh, FID spectra with an acquisition delay close to one millisecond. So there is no uh, signal loss associated with this. And this is exceptionally important for J-coupled metabolites, which have such a J-modulation. Uh, so the signal intensity doesn't drop exponentially, but it drops much faster over the first couple of uh, 30, 40 milliseconds echo time. So this multiplies the, uh, multiplies the detection sensitivity uh, several fold. Uh, here you can also appreciate for our standards, uh, uh, I think uh, an optimized uh, press sequence or so from event card for different uh, acquisition times uh, or uh, echo times, so how the signal uh, drops, especially when you look at the j coupled metabolites in between the main signal uh, singlet resonances. And uh, since most of the metabolites are j coupled metabolites, this is a, a significant advantage. Uh, so there, with this new approach, there are a couple of uh, uh, obstacles or challenges involved. One is the, the macromolecular background because you do not enhance only the signal from these J coupled metabolites, but there are there is this underlying uh, background as you see here in blue from macromolecules which complicate the quantification. Um, here at seven Tesla, this background looks even a more a bit more complicated, but at seven Tesla it's like this, and we have. Uh, shown that we can nicely uh, characterize this background and potentially even separate uh, the different components and analyze these macromolecules. Um, another big obstacle are new sense signals. First of all, there's the water suppression. If you have a poor water suppression, they perform a first order correction uh, of the of the, the error that you have this with this kind of acquisition, then you get such a, a wavy baseline. And if you have cool water suppression, it gets uh, substantially better. Here are the metabolites of interest. And um, what we have done, and there are a couple of approaches to this is, we are uh, fitting our data in a different way. We are not doing a first order correction, but instead incorporate this into our spectral analysis model. So that water signal um, is not uh, causing such uh, residual bumpy baseline corrections. So our spectra look a little bit unusual. Uh, another big problem is the nuisance signal from extracranial lipids. So um, bad water suppression can, for example, lead to such a, a baseline that is not, uh, not uh, straight, can lead to such problems, or maybe even very strong lipid signals here on the very right. And one approach that we were going is with we're trying to go to a very high spatial resolution and addition, introduce additional Hemming weighting. So essentially the signal is not spread and uh, over several nearby voxels, but really uh, originating mostly from this uh, voxel that we are really interested in. Uh, but that's not all. You can improve your spatial uh, resolution as much as you want and the, uh, the, uh, the weighting as much as you want, if you have uh, some kind of instabilities, which could be motion or scanner instabilities, for instance. And we know this for, uh, for quite a long time, for standard T2 weighted uh, images, for example, you have eye movement, you see that the, the signal is distributed along the phase encoder direction. And of course you have the same for the lipid artifacts. And uh, therefore it's important to somehow compensate for this. And for this, we have uh, implemented most of our sequences uh, and real time uh, motion and instability correction technique. Uh, we are using so-called volumetric navigators that we have over time uh, shortened to be com compatible with our 
FID MSI approach, and which are now in the order of 200 uh, milliseconds and can be interleaved in this sequence. And they are able to track the translations and rotations for a rigid body uh, movement, as well as the, the frequency and first order shim terms with a pretty high uh, accuracy, uh, both at three and at seven Tesla. Uh, this is still not sufficient, and uh, therefore it's also necessary, necessary and helpful to use like, a couple of uh, post-processing techniques. I don't want to go into further details, but introduce just one that we use quite frequently, uh, frequently in which was introduced by Bill Vigital originally. And uh, to give you an example, here is a, uh, a multiple sclerosis patient. You see the lesions here, and this is an NAA map when you that we obtained with a nine-fold Grappa-based uh, FID MRSI sequence. And you see this NAA map is as a very poor quality. But if you do an L2 uh, lipid regularization, uh, then you can see, for instance, see the drop in NAA in, in this uh, lesion, for instance, and you can resolve most of these issues. Uh, we have over the time, uh, try to optimize this further. We have uh, introduced coil-wise uh, uh, optimization of this approach and also some iterative optimization. But if you're interested in details, uh, I think that would be too much right now. Let's go to the opportunities. Um, of obviously at seven Tesla, you have more SNR, but you also benefit a lot from the spectral resolution. And I'm not uh, only, again here, we are benefiting mostly for the J-coupled metabolites. Uh, if you look at these check out metabolites resonating between the NA peak here and the creatine peak here at three Tesla, then all of these looks much more, uh, much more crowded and overlapping than here at seven Tesla. Uh, let me give you a nice example. At seven Tesla, you are able, able to separate uh, glutamate and glutamine resonances. So uh, Ivan Skarch has uh, shown here that at 1.5 Tesla and even at four Tesla, metabolites uh, of the, the resonances are, are strongly overlapping. But at seven Tesla, you can start to differentiate these quite nicely here at around uh, 2.6 ppm. And uh, on top of this, you can also separate other metabolites. For example, you can separate uh, at seven Tesla, the NA8 signal and the NA8 D signal quite nicely, and uh, which you could not do at three Tesla, which is uh, this NAA is the signal here next to the NAA peak here. Um, so I think J-coupled metabolites benefit mostly at ultra high field. And uh, you benefit especially when you go to even higher spatial resolution. Here we have uh, performed a simulation study based on real acquired B0 maps from the same subjects as different field strength. And uh, we have simulated how the full width of half maximum to the spectral resolution would be for the NAA at uh, three different uh, spatial resolutions. Um, so with our typical spatial resolutions right now, we are very close to this or somewhere in between these two spatial resolutions. And you can see that uh, you can gain, of course, in spectral resolution when you go to higher field strength, but you really start to gain and also get a better coverage when you go to a better, uh, to a higher spatial resolution, because then you have uh, less intravoxel B0 homogeneities, which is very important. But of course, you can do this only as long as you are not running out of SNR. Um, here's a, a nice, very preliminary example from 10.5 Tesla. I just want to show that in principle, this approach can be used at very, very high speed field strengths without any sound limitation. So here we, we did with Gosha and Greg Metzger uh, some, some two scans actually. One of them worked with the other one. We had problems with the PTX B1 shimming. And uh, here you can see a, a first glutamate map of the, the, the one subject that we scanned. It's just a very early 64-64 matrix with a very suboptimal coil design, I was told, but we were only at 50% of the SAR limitation. So I think there would be even room to run such a sequence on 14 Tesla together with a gradient sequence probably. Um, there is certainly a lot of room for improvements, but um, yeah, we need to get some grant funding or something to do this. Uh, then uh, what you can do even at seven Tesla is you can go to a relatively high spatial resolution, even when you just go with a TR of uh, 200 and you get 
quite nice NA, creatine, choline, and uh, glutamate maps that already show quite detailed an anatomical structures that were not possible with 64 and lower spatial resolutions. Uh, here is also some examples from 9.4 Tesla from Anke Hennig's book from Tübingen, where they showed that with essentially this, the same approach, you can uh, map even more uh, metabolic compounds and um, <clears throat> with the very similar spatial resolution. Let's go to the methods. I have stopped talking uh, about parallel imaging because uh, it has a couple of limitations that I don't want to detail here. Uh, we are now working with non-Cartesian spatial spectral coding techniques. Uh, so these are essentially rings in k-space that we are acquire. And because the k-space density per se is not the one that we target, uh, it's possible to do some density weighting. This is similar to the acquisition weighting approach that is usually done in phase encoding. And then really get a very optimal SNR that is uh, giving us a much higher SNR per unit time and much better uh, lipid artifact removal uh, compared to the parallel imaging techniques that we used before. And here are some uh, early metabolic maps that were acquired a couple of years ago. And you can see we, with this approach, we can accelerate a factor 10 to 50 without any major problems. Uh, the next step was obviously to go to a 3D encoding. And uh, when you combine this now, the, the reduction of uh, the repetition time with this encoding and uh, cover a, a spherical case base with our very simple sequence approach that's here. Um, we can, we have a lot of flexibility. So here's a, a couple of sample uh, protocol settings for when we compare, for instance, a, a sequence with a standard uh, 3D phase encoding with a normal PR that is usually, usually used clinically. This would take for a higher spatial resolution, not hours, but if days. And with this approach with concentric rings and a short TR, we can do the same within a couple of minutes. In some cases, this is not even enough, but uh, first of all, let me show a couple of sample metabolic maps that you can acquire with this low resolution and the higher resolution uh, protocol. Here's some glutamate map, here's some choline map, minosetol and NAE maps. And these take, I think about two minutes and 15 minutes as mentioned before. And uh, all these comes basically at, at uh, no penalty in uh, the spatial accuracy you can hear compare phase encoding, concentric rings, and at all the different spatial resolutions, we essentially get the same uh, spatial uh, accuracy. Um, <clears throat> for, in some cases, this is still not enough. And so we have experimented in combining uh, these concentric ring trajectories with parallel imaging. And for this, we also had to introduce a new uh, interleaved free scan. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but uh, with this, uh, with an interleaved free scans uh, uh, that we are using right now, we have significant uh, advantages. This interleaved musical approach uh, allows us to do parallel imaging and chord combination at once for much higher acceleration of factors. So if you compare our old approach in cases where there are instabilities or less instabilities, you can see probably that when we go to three or four folds uh, additional uh, acceleration, we still get pretty decent uh, uh, metabolic maps, while this essentially breaks down completely for our alternative approaches. Accelerations up to a factor of 1000, uh, 1, uh, which is can be or cannot be necessary. Um, the downside of all of this is uh, the processing of these big data. <clears throat> so if you have this processing pipeline that we usually need to go through, we have the MRSI reconstruction, then usually some artifact removal, quality assurance, spectral quantification, and then ultimately pathology detection. Uh, this is a, a long way to go and especially a problematic if one of your data sets uh, is a raw data set of 100 gigabyte with 100,000 of voxels and more. And these uh, requires significant computing resources and processing times, which is a very prohibitive for clinical studies. And uh, therefore we are trying to solve these problems or some of these with uh, more advanced machine learning and deep learning approaches. We're currently working on MRSI reconstruction and artifacts. 
and started recently with quality assurance and spectral quantification. Now, let me give you a couple of preliminary results. Here is a, a, a coil combination approach that we introduced. So usually in the, in the native sensor space, you have pretty big data. You have, for example, 100 times 100 times 50 times 512 uh, samples in the time domain, and then maybe 64 channels. And when you have this huge data, then uh, usually you need to coil to do the reconstruction pipeline for each uh, coil element before you do the Fourier transformation. And then afterwards, you can do the coil combination, which is by itself very time consuming. And a lot of uh, processing has to be, has to be uh, done at the very end. And you need to keep a lot of data in the, in the RAM. So what we try to do is uh, using deep learning uh, to the core combination at the very beginning, uh, and then to uh, one step reconstruction, for example, using an automap deep learning approach to basically do the, the whole, uh, the, most of the reconstruction already on the fly. Uh, what's complicated about this is that uh, in, uh, this is then not a multiplication anymore with a sensitivity map, but you have to do this uh, as a, a kernel operation, like a grapper, for example. And for this, because we have non-Cartesian trajectories, we had to introduce a, a new geometric deep learning approach that hasn't so far not been used uh, in MRI for reconstructions. Um, actually, this is already published. It's not only at ISMIM, but it was published in the MRM. Uh, I think this is a very nice approach to, to lessen the problems with uh, online reconstruction. Another point is um, uh, the case-based reconstruction, for example, for parallel imaging. Um, so we want to do parallel imaging reconstruction, for example, in this uh, non-Cartesian case space. And again, uh, we this if we want to use the, the, the case-based uh, kernel approach, but here it's very difficult uh, to use um, the grapper approach because we don't have a Cartesian case base and we cannot repeat the grapper kernels. What we can do is we can uh, tra train a neural network to learn uh, the, the position and the weights uh, that are important for the different neighbors, irrespective of where the position in this case base is. And here are some early results of this. So if you use parallel imaging reconstruction using a standard approach, then we get such choline and creatine maps uh, at different positions. And when we use our deep learning approach, we get uh, pretty similar results uh, like, like this, but we can do the, uh, the reconstruction much faster. Um, so the idea is then to do the whole uh, core combination of parallel imaging already at the, at the very beginning and then have not, nothing to do at, uh, at the end of the acquisition. Um, another approach is uh, improving the uh, stability by dynamically estimating the zeros. And uh, here we have uh, a study that we have currently under review in MRM, uh, where we have uh, used uh, training data from nine volunteers and we trained a, a, we supervised a training and neural network. And we used the following input data. We have a, a B0 map at the very initial position. Then we have an MPRH sequence or any uh, atomic MRI at the initial position, which is essentially those two here. And then uh, we have an MP2 range at a new position. We can essentially take this and then co-register it or apply a transformation matrix uh, that we got from uh, optical tracking, for instance. And then, um, the output of this network should be the B0 map at the new position. So we don't need to measure the B0 map really because that's complicated with navigators, but we can predict it on the fly. And we trained uh, this with uh, about 900 training data and augmented this data. And here's some uh, early results of this, where we can see uh, that uh, if this is the ground truth B0 map, and uh, this is predicted with the neuronal network, then we come pretty close to what was the, uh, the ground truth. While when we use an, uh, a very uh, simple approach where we do only co-registration of the B0 map, this performs much worse 
And if we essentially do no correction at all, of course, the, the head is in a different position. And um, so essentially, the, uh, the, uh, applying this uh, neural network takes about a, a five to 10 milliseconds right now. So we think that when we, when we have an optical trap tracking input, we can uh, predict B0 map changes due to uh, motion with a very high uh, temporal resolution and apply them for real-time corrections. And here's some um, result where we can really see that we come much closer to the ground truth than with the other traditional uh, approaches. Uh, now let's jump to the clinical applications. Uh, so far, we have been scanning uh, about 300 patients at our seven Tesla scanner. The last time, uh, the last year was less productive because of the COVID crisis. Nevertheless, we have now more than 100 brain tumor patients scanned, about 170 multiple sclerosis scans, uh, quite a number of patients with up to five year follow up. We have started to uh, investigate uh, epilepsy cases and also uh, the, we have a group interested here in rare diseases. Let me introduce a couple of our early results on multiple sclerosis. Uh, if you um, know, maybe most of previous studies have been performed using single box spectroscopy or MRSI techniques with uh, metric sizes of 1616 spatial resolution. Uh, you may appreciate these uh, minus at all to NAA map, which essentially show you that in really, you need to be really able to, to capture the the metabolic changes that uh, you see in multiple sclerosis lesions, you need to go to a much, much higher spatial resolution. And here we see uh, some results of uh, 100 times 100 uh, matrix with uh, at that time with just a single slice acquisition. And you can see that when you go to such a high spatial resolution of about two and a half millimeter isotropic resolution, which was uh, acquired in six minutes, nevertheless, which is clinically tolerable, uh, you can uh, suddenly start to really uh, analyze these uh, lesions with uh, no major partial volume contributions. And um, here you can maybe see again here yeah, that the high spatial resolution is really necessary because otherwise in some cases you would not see any metabolic changes at all. Uh, this is also very uh, important if you want to, for instance, look at cortical pathologies what legal lesions are a very, a very hot topic in MS and um, it's not easy to see this cortical lesion on this uh, flare image, but uh, you can see nicely the metabolic changes here on this minus two to an AMAP. Um, uh, one of the recently published papers uh, is uh, the one in Radiology 2021. Uh, where we have um, studied a cohort of 65 relaxing, relapsing rheumatic MS patients and a, a, a subgroup of age and sex match health controls. And uh, the quite interesting result was that uh, when we compared different uh, groups of patients with uh, different uh, disabilities, so EDSS score of 3.5 indicates a higher disability, then uh, you can see that uh, for the increasing EDSS scores, you see a drop in choline to creatine ratios. You see also obviously a drop in NAA, uh, but you do not see such a drop in uh, the minus dot over time, uh, which is quite interesting. If you compare it with this gray shaded area, then this is the, these are basically the normal values for healthy controls, which indicates that the minus at all changes are already happening at a very, very early time point. And this is also somehow indicated uh, here and uh, you see that there is a, a less strong correlation over time than you would see uh, with the other metabolites. Um, but that's not all. I think it's also very interesting that in a couple of cases, we, we saw uh, changes in the minus at all levels that were not really uh, expected from the conventional MRI. For example, here you would see a very uh, hyperintense lesion on the flare on the right-hand side, while there is not much going on on the left-hand side, but while this represents or presents completely different on the metabolic map for minus at all, for instance, where you see the higher minus at all increase on the other side. 
Uh, we see this now also with uh, our 3D MRSI approach that we are using uh, over a bit more than a half or one, one, one and a half years. And again, here you see such a spot where you don't see major changes on the flare map, for instance. And these uh, changes can be really very substantial. We have therefore looked into our uh, database of uh, multiple sclerosis uh, patient scans that we had, and we selected a subgroup of 51 patients with relapsing, remitting, and S again. And in this, uh, for the single slice that we measured and investigated with, M uh, with MRSI, we identified 779 uh, lesions. Uh, but the interesting thing was that uh, only about 7, 750 of those were really visible. Uh, also on conventional MRI, and we had uh, 29 cases uh, where we see some hot spots on the total NA2 minus low maps that were not visible on the conventional MRI. Uh, these are approximately 4% of the hot spots. Maybe it's not good to call them lesions, but it's, it's an interesting observation. 4% may not be much, but I think it's really worth to investigate this further in longitudinal studies especially because these hotspots tended to have even higher minus to NAA ratios than we observe uh, in of obviously in normal appearing white matter, but even higher than we observe in the conventional MRI visible lesions. Uh, we're also looking uh, in more detail into iron accumulating lesions. But as you can see here, there is really even another step up in the ratios for these MRSI visible lesions. Um, here are some early results that we haven't fully evaluated yet when we compare here four year follow up for a secondary progressive MS case and a more benign uh, disease course in another MS patient. You can nicely see that uh, you see an increase in these minus the total NA ratios. And uh, what we are trying to do here is we want to see whether. Uh, minus at all is maybe indicative of uh, lesion formation. Uh, I think these are very preliminary uh, indications that we have, but uh, I think uh, we have some indication that there might be such a trend in this direction. But the problem is we have limited to only a single slice, which makes it easy to spot new lesions. Then uh, let's jump to uh, brain tumors. Uh, here's an example of a uh, suspected uh, recurrence. Uh, it's not really clear if this uh, gadolinium enhancement here is uh, really a recurrence or the, just to the reg uh, regression. And here is a, a flare map. And here is a, a methionine pet. And uh, here we did a patch based super resolution reconstruction on our uh, MRSI map. And you can maybe appreciate the information that you get with these multiple metabolic maps, which all uh, have complementary information. So here, for example, we see uh, that the, it, there is an indication that around the, the lesion, there seems to be increased choline, which could be uh, uh, increased cell proliferation. We see a drop in NAA and creatine on the entire left uh, hemisphere. We see a uh, no, uh, drop in inositol, but we see an uh, increase in uh, glutamate and uh, even bigger uh, increase in the in uh, a larger uh, area of the left hemisphere in the glutamine. And here's a couple of ratios. Uh, we have now published recently a paper in uh, Neuroimage Clinical where we used uh, an more advanced 3D MRSI approach. And I think what is quite interesting here that we can map up to six oncometabolites uh, relatively reliable with this approach. And uh, we see hotspots of choline and, for example, glutamine not, not always at the same spot. So, for example, here you see a spot uh, within this tumor where you see the increased choline, but there is a different hotspot for increased uh, glutamine. And um, you can see also when you pick out some of these uh, spectra, you see the expected increase in choline, you see the drop in NA here. But if you look at the glutamine hotspot, uh, this presents completely different. In this case, the choline is not vastly increased. The NAA is reduced, but the glutamine is almost as, as big as, as the NAA peak and uh, even bigger than choline to creatine. And there we can also make metabolic maps of, of glycines, for instance. And of course, we have the metabolite uh, 
uh, in air and, and creatine and so on still. Uh, we have then uh, moved forward uh, recently to compare MRSI with uh, PET. And uh, here's a, an example. We have an, an astrocytoma IDH mutated grade four. And you see here a, a med PET um, alongside uh, ratios to choline, glutamine, and uh, glycine. And uh, your corresponding uh, seven Tesla flare. And what's quite interesting is when we do calculate the similarity index, the dice uh, coefficient, uh, it's interesting to observe that the correlation is better for a uh, methionine pet, pet, which is also an uh, amino acid tracer, for those um, uh, metabolites that are also amino acids like uh, glutamine and uh, glycine, for instance, which is uh, having a better correlation that as you see here, for example, uh, for the dice coefficients reaching about uh, 0 0.65. Um, also, this has uh, recently been submitted. And then let's move to some uh, treatment resistant epilepsy cases. Here is again an FDG PET uh, example. Um, it is suspected that you have here some cortical malformation. You can see this somehow or because of these diffuse white matter, gray matter um, areas here in the upper right corner in the preoperative seven Tesla MRI. And uh, you can see quite nicely also on the choline map, uh, for instance, that you have here substantial alterations, but indicating even that it's a, a bigger area than uh, just shown on the, uh, on the T1 rated MRI. And obviously this um, uh, needed to be proven by electro or cortical uh, or ECG, uh, which is uh, at our center done interoperatively. And then uh, a post-operative MRI has been done. And we're doing this now in a couple of cases and uh, trying to correlate the post-operative MRI outcome with the predicted uh, detections made by metabolic imaging. Um, then uh, let me jump to more neuroscience application before I run out of time. Uh, neurotransmitters are obviously the, the, the core focus of uh, neuroscience and psychiatry. And uh, the, the major advantage at 7 Tesla is that the, uh, we can investigate much better the GABA glutamate glutamine cycling, uh, which is the inter important for the interaction between astrocytes and uh, glutamate, uh, glutaminergic and GABAergic neurons. And uh, here's an example of the NASA spectral separation that helps us to uh, separate glutamate and glutamine uh, with a extremely high spatial resolution of about 80, 80, 47 over big parts of uh, the uh, cerebrum here uh, in a relatively acceptable scan time for neuroscience applications. Uh, but it's not that straightforward to directly measure GABA. Uh, therefore, we have been also investigating uh, spectral editing MRSI methods for seven Tesla. Uh, so here are some examples where we did uh, GABA mapping using a traditional uh, GABA mapping approach. Uh, here's a GABA to NA map, for example. Um, but you see that the expected uh, uh, gray matter to white matter fraction is, is not as, uh, as, as good as we would want it because it, there is also additional contamination from a macromolecule. And therefore we have also been working on uh, techniques that allow us to measure a more pure GABA. And uh, maybe you can here appreciate the, the better uh, gray matter white matter fraction that would be expected uh, for GABA here on this GABA 20 map. Uh, the downside of this is this is just still a single slice method with a 20 minute scan time. And uh, we've currently no real funding to follow up on this. But I think we, this has really a high potential for psychiatric uh, disorders. And then what we have also preliminarily started is a dynamic neurotransmitter metabolism scans. Uh, here we are doing a time resolved MRSI scans. You see metabolic maps acquired every four minutes with three minute scan time. So this is a glutamate map. And then when we do, for example, a, a finger tapping task, we have a stimulation and then a rest, and then again, finger tapping and rest. 
we can really see on uh, on those maps or when we su sum up a couple of these voxel in these maps that we have substantial increases and drops in the glutamate uh, signal or the, the ratio signals, which are somehow in the order of eight to, uh, to, to 10%. And uh, here is a, a nice example from a single subject where we so just subtracted uh, two glutamate metabolic maps uh, that corresponds quite nicely to the uh, motor cortex uh, region that was activated, also shown here by the bold fMRI. And uh, this corresponds um, uh, in some, some way in, uh, with the functional MRSI experience that we have done. Uh, one uh, thing that I think is particularly interesting uh, and what we are working on right now is uh, deuterium metabolic uh, imaging. Uh, uh, you can do this directly by detecting uh, the deuterium signal uh, with a deuterium hardware, but you can also, instead of uh, observing it directly, indirectly detect the drop in proton signal. Uh, and uh, what you essentially observe by this is you can, for instance, uh, uh, take uh, orally um, a, a deuterated glucose. So essentially, you replace the proton signal uh, the nuclei here by deuterium, and then when uh, you have a non-oxidative uh, metabolism, then all of this is uh, turned into lactate. So this would be the case, for instance, for a brain tumor. Uh, but in a normal brain, this would be uh, going through the uh, TCA cycle, and then would in the end be turned into a deuterated uh, labeled glutamate, and then at the end, glutamine as well as GABA. And uh, here are some early results where we did this uh, using MRSI. We also did this for single voxel spectroscopy. But when we gave this um, approximately 50 gram of deuterated glucose, you can see quite nicely uh, here on these metabolic maps over about um, a bit more than an hour that uh, when you do give deuterated glucose, you see a drop in the signal intensity of the uh, glutamate because it starts to be deuterated, which is in the order of about 15 to 20%. Uh, while when you give uh, make a control experiment with uh, non-deuterated glucose, so it's essentially a dextrose, then you do not see uh, major differences here. Um, when you sum up a couple of these voxels uh, in, in a region of interest, you can, for example, calculate the fractional uh, loss in the GLU4, that, that is the labeled uh, resonance uh, over time. And you can see quite nicely, there is a, a clear trend of, of, of loss that can be exponentially fitted uh, and uh, is uh, somewhat different between uh, the white matter and gray matter. I think it's about 20% 20, 20 changes. And uh, here we, you can maybe side by side uh, see what happened to the GLU4 resonance when you have that at uh, five minutes uh, after um, starting the scan. So, and then compare this with something that's a bit more uh, than one hour later. And uh, we've also started to do some, uh, some trying to, to fit this exponential curve. And you can see some uh, gray matter, white matter uh, res uh, differences here, but we in the periphery still have some uh, issues uh, that we still need to resolve to, to get better stability in the outer regions. And um, here are some different maps. I think it's much easier to see here when you have the first time point and the last time point, and then you subtract those spectra we essentially see mostly uh, the tutorated uh, compounds that were changed. And here is, for example, the GLU4 resonance, which is the dominated signal. And then somewhat separated here, you see the, the glutamine 4 and the expected to change in the GABA2 uh, resonance. Of course, this is a 50 fold enhanced. Um, and then uh, here you see some time courses for over five subjects. We see the deuterated glucose, uh, the exponential uh, drop in the signal, and then uh, here you see it for the glutamate, and here you see it for the glutamine. Here, it's uh, the SNR is not good enough to really fit an exponential curve, so that we are doing just linear fitting. Uh, but in, you see, obviously, in the non-deuterated glucose case, uh, everything is pretty stable. You see this also on the, the p values and the r square values. Uh, so uh, I've come to an end. Um, uh, 
maybe an outlook. So I think we are still have to work quite a lot and, and hard on the reconstruction uh, to make this uh, more straightforward, maybe implement this on the scanner. We need to include more spatial spectral knowledge, potentially deep learning approaches in those cases where th those are really superior. And then we need to invest a lot in the automation of quantification and quality assurance um, to ultimately reach a better scanner integration. We are, for example, now working on ice reconstruction uh, pipeline, but it's not, not very easy. And because of the potential we see in functional MRSI and this uh, indirect deuterium labeling, we're also trying to improve uh, the, the, the spatial and temporal resolution of dynamic MRSI experiments and also invest into the stability of these sequences much more. And then uh, we're trying to move to even higher field strength, which is maybe not clinically relevant, but at least scientifically relevant. And we're working together, uh, hopefully much more in the future with the CMRR Minnesota group. And with this, I've come to my, at the end of my presentation, I want to thank uh, all our collaborators and uh, the, the researchers working at our institution. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Wolfgang. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, we can all uh, give Wolfgang a virtual round of applause by using the reaction button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions.